Peter Conrad is actually born in Australia, and he studied English literature there, and then came to London, taught at Christ Church in the United States of Oxford for many years. He's been a visiting professor here in the States, and he has written a number of books of cultural criticism, including and also a major history of English literature. Uh, <clears throat> he writes for many magazines and newspapers, and we're very fortunate that he could be here in New York on this occasion. Uh, Fred Cohn is a very frequent contributor to Opera News. I'm sure you've all seen his byline. And he also writes for other classical music publications. He happens to be a good friend of our Vice President, Kit Gill, and a, a conversation that they had resulted in our program tonight. So we're very pleased that you could be here, and thank you, gentlemen, very much for participating. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Natalie has given you Peter's biographical details, but uh, I want to talk a bit about his history with opera. He was a, a Rhodes Scholar studying at Oxford uh, in the early 70s, I think, or late 60s. He went to a performance of Otello at Covent Garden, and he was hooked. Uh, and uh, in 1987, he wrote a book called A Song of Love and Death, The Meaning of Opera, which is his intensely subjective, subjective look at the whole standard repertoire. Um, he sort of went back to that ground four years ago when he came out with Verdi and or Wagner, uh, but it's a very different kind of book. Obviously, it compares the lives and output of these two titans. Uh, and uh, if you haven't read the book, I urge you to do so. If you, if you have, you'll know just how surprising, unexpected, provocative, and even naughty Peter's perspectives can be. And he's come to share some of them with us tonight. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Conrad. I feel as if you challenge me to be naughty. <laughs> I, do I, don't, I, I don't think you have much trouble. Uh, <laughs> now, it was your idea to call this The Greatest of the Monsters after Auden's essay. Uh, and I, I, think you, I think you have to explain that. Well, I suppose it was a a little bit of a, a provocation. I made sure that I put the phrase in quote marks and put a question mark mm -hmm. after it. And it seemed to have done its work of provoking almost immediately because the moment uh, I sent it to Natalie as a proposed title, she sent me back an email from someone who may or may not be here tonight who said this is uh, not a good title because the greatest of the monsters must always be Hitler, with which I guess I would agree. But uh, no, I mean, the, the phrase, The Greatest of the Monsters, was the title that The New Yorker gave to a book review by W.H. Auden of Robert Gutman's biography of Wagner, which appeared sometime in the mm -hmm. 60s, I think. It was the, the first biography of Wagner that I ever read, and I reread it uh, the other day in preparation for, for giving this talk. And to my amazement, it's, it's extraordinarily hostile hmm. towards Wagner. Uh, it finishes uh, by treating him uh, as being someone who is in a state of complete moral and intellectual collapse at the end of his life when uh, when he was composing Falstaff. And of Parsifal. Parsifal. Mm -hmm. Parsifal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that was a senior moment, not a moment of naughtiness. Uh, uh, and uh, Auden's great struggle in this very, very good essay on mm -hmm. the book is to somehow reconcile what he agrees to be the monstrosity of Wagner's behavior. I mean, he's ripping off of all of his creditors, his, uh, his treacherous behavior towards his acolytes, his uh, helping himself to other people's wives, etc., etc. Desperate attempt to reconcile all of this with his admiration for the music and with, uh, with Wagner's and with Auden's own Christianity. I mean, he finishes... He finishes by saying that somehow Wagner can be reconciled with morality, that Wagner is ultimately on the side of reason, order, and civilization, which for Auden are such important ideas that he gives them a capital letter. But the way that it works for Auden is, is very strange. I mean, it gives us a lot to talk about, I think. I mean, Auden says that 
the way Wagner's operas work on us is to tease out, to pander to everything that is Wagnerian in ourselves, by which he means everything that's morbid, neurotic, uh, lustful, crazy, um, power-hungry, etc. You know, we discover the monster in ourselves and then are so shocked by this revelation that we are scared straight, which doesn't seem to me to be what goes on at all, but that's his argument. And then, I mean, then it occurred to me that, in fact, Auden was not the first to call Wagner a monster, because from a completely different point of view, there's a marvelous short American um, newspaper essay by the critic uh, Deems Taylor, which was published in 1937, I think, uh, published in, a, in whichever New York newspaper he wrote for back in the days when uh, the best critic in town was not Anthony Tomazzini, uh, which was also called simply The Monster, and it begins by saying he was a little man with an extremely inflated idea of himself, extremely conceited person. It doesn't name this, this monster, but it goes through his uh, crimes against morality uh, for some considerable um, length of time, two or three pages. I mean, point, it gives you the, the usual rap against Wagner that he was sexually treacherous, a serial adulterer, that he ripped off money from total strangers, never paid anyone back, couldn't keep friends, believed that he was the greatest artist who ever lived, etc., etc., etc. And then it twists the tale beautifully by saying, and you know what? All of this is true, and yet none of it matters, hmm. because in fact this man was almost as great an artist as his conceit about himself suggested. So we left with you know, two different views of, of Wagner the monster, one saying that he behaved monstrously, but his art uh, atones for this, and we should forget about it now because all we have left is the music. And the other is Auden's point of view, which um, lays some pretty heavy charges against him. There's a parallel essay by Auden about Verdi in which he says that Verdi is, by contrast with Wagner, whom he calls a shit, Verdi was uh, a rare case of a genius who was almost also a gentleman and was one of the very great artists whom Auden, one of the few very great artists whom Auden wishes that he might have met. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the, it gives us, gives us a, a, two different views to juggle. The idea of monstrosity is interesting in itself, too, because, um, you know, it's an idea that's, that's very close to to Wagner's own creative world. I mean, half of the characters in his operas are gods and the other half are, are monsters, and mm -hmm. there are actually very few human beings there. Mm -hmm. uh, when you were, I mean, these must be the issues you were grappling with as you were writing uh, Verdi and or Wagner. I mean, this must have been a constant dialogue in your own mind. Uh, it, it, it was a bit, yeah, uh, and it, it had a rather unexpected outcome because... Um, it's easy enough to admire and sympathize with, with Verdi as a, as a human being. Uh, and yet, you know, he was, he was not quite such a benign and amiable person as, as uh, Auden makes out in this essay about the, the genius and the, and the gentleman. I mean, he was, he was very you know, kind of cold, hard, unyielding, adamantine, unemotional I mean, to, to the despair of his poor second wife. I mean, he, he, kept, he kept his emotional life for his music mm -hmm. and uh, expended very little of it on his dealings with um, other human beings. Uh, and he's very, very hard to get inside somehow. I mean, when I went to to visit his home at, at Santa Gata, the, the estate where he settled near Buzetta, where he was born. Mm -hmm. And I was very struck by a great terracotta bust of him by a sculptor called Vincenzo Gemito, in which uh, Verdi is looking down like this, I mean, kind of frowning, but not meeting your eyes. I mean, as if he's listening to some, you know, he's waiting for some melody to come into his head or listening to some secret harmony or other. I mean, he's a very forbidding kind of character. I found him ultimately really unintelligible. I mean, because I mean, he was a, he behaved like a businessman, dressed like a, a businessman. I mean, was mostly preoccupied with uh, raking in the receipts from the music. You wonder, where does the music come from? 
Whereas with Wagner, you know where the music comes from. It comes from his own sufferings and neuroses and from what was going on inside him. What I found, I mean, when trying to understand the two of them uh, was that it was, it was much easier to understand Wagner. For a start, I mean, he suffered from some of the ailments that I suffer from, so there was a kind of physiological sympathy. I mean, he had very bad skin, uh, and the skin was always flaring up, and he was scratching the whole time, which made me think, ah, fellow sufferer. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he also couldn't sleep and referred to his bed as the, his, his vexation machine, so I think of that every time I have a, a bad night. Uh, and uh, I, I, I got eventually to to really feel an extraordinary sympathy with him from reading Cosima's diaries, which are irritating because they're so sycophantic, of course, and, and because they deify him. But they give you a, a sense that of quite intimate contact with this man who had an extraordinary mind, who was interested in in everything, who had theories and and ideas about everything, some of them batty, some of them poisonous, and and some of them brilliant. And they also give you a sense of... But they give you a real sense of where the music comes from, which is from the, the turbulence of his own emotional life and his nervous life, mm-hmm. really. I mean, they, the music comes from his own neuroses. I mean, he was the, the first musician, I suspect, you know, I mean, really to listen to what went on in the, the human body. I mean, the boiling of the blood, the twitching of the nerves, the, you know, and the whole sort of oversensitivity of the organism, which, which made him so addicted to all of those perfumes and, and uh, scented oils that he poured into his bath and made him so the, uh, the velvet. hypersensitive, yeah, that he had to, mm-hmm. yeah, he couldn't bear cotton next mm-hmm. to his skin because right. it felt like barbed wire. So he had to be swathed in silk and satin and, and his shoes had to be filled with fur mm-hmm. so that there wouldn't be anything as coarse as leather next to his skin. This, this whole, you know, sort of decadent over-refinement, mm-hmm. uh, which I, I mean, I, I got, I got quite to like and, uh, and envy. And I, I, wish, I well, wish, wish that I could afford some of it. But not perhaps the, the pink house coats that he had, this Viennese milliner yeah. uh, designed for him. But couldn't you see that as evidence of someone who's so exquisitely attuned to his own self that, that, uh, that there's almost no world for the, the rest of the world, no room for the rest of the world there? That, you would think so, and yet the rest of the world was very anxious mm-hmm. to be there. I mean, mm-hmm. as everyone's presence in this room tonight mm-hmm. testifies. Right. I mean, he was a, it was an extraordinary artistic achievement, really, to, uh, to start with this very you know, perverse, private, uh, individual world, and yet um, convene a whole world of Wagnerites, of, of mm-hmm. Wagnerians. I mean, you know, to to create a kind of cult or a, a church, more or less. Um, you know, there were lots of there were lots of people who were anxious to sign on for this. And the I mean, the the thing that almost the part of it that I most enjoyed finding out about mm-hmm. was the kind of mad Wagnerism of the late nineteenth century, of the eighteen eighties <laughs> and and eighteen nineties, of these of these people, the followers of Wagner in life, but also in fiction, people for whom listening to the music was not enough. They had to act the, the music out. I well, mean, you I have that chapter in your book where all these fantasy at the novels. Yeah, yeah. Like these. Uh, yeah, I remember in the review that, that you wrote of the book, you said that you were very glad that I had read all of these books because now no one else would have to. <laughs> but, but, I mean, they are, they are simply extraordinary. I mean, there's one... I mean, and, and they showed the lengths that these people would would go to. Mm. Um, there's one by Danuncio, uh, the mad fascist nationalist Italian poet called The Triumph of Death, uh, which, which finishes with this crazed um, uh, character called Giorgio, something who takes his mistress away to some remote house uh, on, on a cliff in Italy, imports a piano and hunkers down with her to play through the score of Tristan. And as he plays, uh, he 
narrates the thing to her and performs all of the parts. And when they get to the end of the opera, he takes her for a walk on the cliff. Uh, they pause to look at the view, and he pushes her over. Um, and she doesn't go quietly, however. I mean, this is a very un Wagnerian death because she drags him after her and on the way plummeting down to the rocks at the base of the cliff. She is clawing at him and tearing his, his hair out. And so on. it's a very different kind of love death from, from what you would get mm-hmm. in with Center and the Dutchman mm-hmm. or uh, Tristan and Isolde. And yet, uh, you know, people, people felt that this music was a kind of prescription for living or maybe a prescription for dying. The thing that, the one that I like most, uh, I long for an excuse to read this book again. I mean, it must be one of the worst novels ever written. <laughs> but it's so crazy. It's, it's a thing called, uh, I'm now going to have a senior moment and forget the title. Uh, it's by Gertrude Atherton, uh, The Tower of Ivory, it's called. Uh, it's about an American Wagnerian who grows up, uh, a, a soprano to be, who grows up in a mining town in Colorado in conditions of dire poverty, escapes from that, comes to New York, uh, plies her trade on the streets as a prostitute, but um, keeps a certain amount of money aside not to give to her pimp, but for voice lessons and studies to sing opera, then eventually gets a rich protector. And after sleeping her way up the, the greasy pole, eventually becomes a great world-famous um, Wagnerian soprano. All of the past, her sordid past, is, is um, expunged from the record, of course, until uh, one of her admirers throws everything away for her. This is a young uh, English aristocrat called, I think, Lord Bridgeminster or something like this, who has got a wife uh, and uh, a country home and so on, a completely respectable background, but jettisons everything in order to run after her. Uh, He's away with her as she's singing Wagner somewhere or other in Munich or or Berlin when his wife is giving birth and the wife dies in childbirth and he is not there because he's so besotted with this woman who's called Margarita Steer, spelled S-T-Y-R, although maybe it's some sort of pun on on S-T-W-E-R, I don't know. But she is overcome by guilt and fesses up about her whole past to him and he's completely disgusted and she becomes then disgusted with herself. And what she does wonderfully is punish herself at the end of a performance of Götterdämmerung in Munich by actually riding into the pyre (laughs) and incinerating herself. You're not not told whether the horse willingly (laughs) went with her or whether she dismounted and hurled herself Uh in, but she goes up in flames Mm. to apologize for her wicked life. (laughs) And it's not only only in the 19th century. I mean, there's also uh, in the 50s, I mean, a really unwatchably horrible Japanese film directed by Yukio Mishima, the novelist who everyone will remember Mm -hmm. attempted to stage a military coup against the democratic Japanese government sometime in the early 1970s, and when the attempted coup failed, committed harikiri in the office of the the military commandant in Tokyo. Uh, He... this, this um, film is a short film called Patriotism, based on a story by Mishima, uh, in which, which Mishima directed and in which he appears, which is about an earlier fascist coup sometime in the 1930s, which also failed. And its failure means that uh, the captain, the role played by Mishima, has to come home and commit ritual suicide and get his wife to do so as well. I mean, it's unwatchably horrible um, <laughs> because it's so graphic. Um, they slit their stomachs open in, in full view, and what they slit open is a full stomach containing the bladder and intestines of a pig, you know, which spill all over the floor. I mean, uh, then he has um, trouble giving himself the coup de grace, and, and the wife has to help him out. Um, this floor is, you know, kind of a lake of blood, like the mm-hmm. man's recent Parsifal. 
mm. in fact, but somehow worse, although it's, it's all in black and white. And all of this is happening mm. to the score of Tristan and Isolde, the symphonic synthesis of Tristan and Isolde mm. conducted by Stokowski. Mm. So, you know, I mean, the, the really weird thing is that people feel, people felt and still did feel uh, in the case of Mishima, uh, until relatively recently, that Wagner was telling them to go and do likewise, yes. as Christ said to his disciples. Right. You know? it's Except hard that to Wagner himself never did any of this kind of stuff. No, of course. It's hard to imagine Verdi inspiring a similar mode of, of, of <laughs> fiction. No, <laughs> no, 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 in, in, indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when Verdi went to uh, hear Lohengrin, the first time Lohengrin... Uh, was performed in Italy. I think it was in Bologna. He hid in a in a side box and followed it with a score, hiding, uh, supposedly because he didn't want to upstage the performance of another composer, but really because he didn't want anyone to see that he was so curious that mm. he'd come to another city mm. to hear the music of his great competitor. Mm. And he was spotted by someone uh, in the orchestra stalls during the interval, and of course the Italians all implored it. This man who's a great cultural hero, very was terribly annoyed mm -hmm. to have been spotted at someone else's performance. But uh, he followed Lohengrin with the score, and one of the notations that he made in the margin was a matto. He's completely mad. Hmm. Uh, which, which, you know, I mean, in a, in a way, I suppose, was, was true of Wagner. I mean, the operas are all about these extreme states, mm -hmm. uh, which are, was, you know, somewhere between life and death, somewhere between suicide and transfiguration. I mean, who knows quite what, what is going on. You said to me uh, when I interviewed you uh, about a year ago about this book, and you said, the dark side of me responds to Wagner, the better side to Verity. Oh, did I? I you said that, I, yes. I said that I had a better side? <laughs> <laughs> Seemed dubious to me. but Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I should have said... Us, I suppose, rather than mm. naming myself. But I mean, yeah, I mean, the, I do have the feeling with Verdi that uh, this music actually makes you feel more tenderly towards other human beings and mm. makes you feel more humane, more empathetic, and more Wagner. sympathetic. Yeah, and the, and that's why tears are, are so important in Verdi. I mean, the fact that one character can make another. Mm -hmm. Cry and the tears are a kind of testament to some union be between them. I mean, there's just absolutely heartbreaking moment at the end of Don Carlos, mm -hmm. where these two people are singing about you know, the fact that they're never going to see one another again, and the rest of their lives, such as they are, are going to be completely miserable. And uh, Elizabeth, n no, it was Carlos who sees that Elizabeth is is crying, mm -hmm. which is the closest she comes to an admission that. She loves no one but him, uh, and she then says, uh, oh, "No, but these are you know tears of admiration for the heroic labor that you're going to go and perform in mm. liberating Flanders and so on." I mean, there's you know the, these operas are, are very moving and, and uh, how humanly is that moving in a way that, that and Wagner, that, how is well, yeah, I mean, the, just think about the, the two words. I mean, there's Rigoletto says to Gilda, when mm. he's explaining how he came to get married and produce her, he says, uh, you know, your mother, per compassion mi amo, she mm -hmm. loved me out of compassion mm -hmm. because I was you know, so ugly and deformed. And so on. I mean, the, the, there's a, a parallel word in Wagner which is very important for him, which, which comes up again and again, which is mitleid, which is, you, you would think, I mean, the German version of compassion. Um, Mitleid means, you know, suffering with someone else. And yet, uh, you know, the, the, the suffering that you get in Wagner, I mean, you know, the, think a bit in Parsifal. I mean, you suffer for the death of the swan, mm -hmm. you know, which is an extraordinarily moving moment mm -hmm. musically when Gunnermanns talks about the free glory of the swan mm -hmm. that was... Uh, kind of coasting on the air, and you can feel the breeze underneath the wings of the swan. It's a glorious, glorious music. Gorgeous. But it's a, it's a bird, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't you don't feel that about uh, human beings when they die in Wagner, because you know, I mean, death is after all what they 
what they all want, I suppose. I mean, similarly, I mean, the, you know, the, re- the regeneration of the, of the world at spring in that other great aria of Gunamansa's mm-hmm. about the spring meadow right. coming back to life. It's, it's all about the regeneration of nature, the, you know, the immortality of nature. It's not about human beings. And I was very struck by something John Adams s- said. I mean, I think it's a, it's a passage in his autobiography where he describes going on a drive through the San Gabriel Mountains or somewhere in, in California, a very kind of Wagnerian landscape, mountainous with great sunsets and so on. And he was listening to Goethe Damerung on his Ardcar stereo. And he said, he was so struck by this music at a certain point that he said to himself out loud, ah, yes, he cares. Mm. But, you know, you wonder just what it is that Wagner does care about, you know, the, and the, not about but not about human beings. I isn't, think. Isn't he fin- cares about nature. And isn't the life Proton's of nature. farewell? That's a that's a human that's a human moment. A father saying farewell to his daughter. It's it's uh, in, in fact very similar yeah. to the Don Carlo duet that you mentioned. Well, that yeah, they but, will never but see he can only again. say those things to her once he is put at asleep, uh-huh. and. Ah. Uh, because up to that point, he's berating her and abusing her and terrorizing her by saying that she's going to lie there waiting for any common old proletarian to come along and turn mm-hmm. her into a housewife. Mm-hmm. You know, and all of these <laughs> these terrible <laughs> predictions that make her shriek with the horror, with terror. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then the moment he puts her to sleep and the orchestra piles up on top of her with this great surge, it's only at that point that he can say all of these things mm-hmm. to her, which makes you wonder just what kind of truth the music is telling. Uh, the, the most recent ring at, at Covent Garden, which was directed by Keith Warner, made this actually quite a, an incestuous moment um, because the moment that she was unconscious, the, the Votan of Turfold, you know, kind of grabbed her in an embrace which was more than paternal. Mm-hmm. And in this opera, which is so concerned with incest, incest absolutely. where he refers to Brunhilde as the womb of his wishes, you, know, mm. the, uh, <laughs> you think, you know, maybe now we're getting the truth, but it's the orchestra which is telling us the truth. Mm-hmm. And it's able to, to tell us the truth because there's only one person singing now. Brunhilde is, is already asleep. Mm-hmm. Now, this is one of the reasons, I think, why Wagner made it a, a principle um, that opera should be monodic, that you should never have characters singing in duets. Um, mm-hmm. It should be one person singing and then another person singing, whereas in, in Verdi, um, the great moments in the operas, I think, are these enormous ensembles, mm-hmm. you know, in Aida or uh, the with, with end the of conflicting the emotions of, of all. Where well, you think that, you know, the whole world yeah. is now um, coming to life. Everyone in the world is voicing their different version of mm-hmm. these events. Mm-hmm. I mean, a voice has been conferred on everyone. And, you know, if only we could hear what all of these people are individually saying. I mean, you know, we'd be like God. We'd be able to listen to to every individual simultaneously. Whereas Wagner only has time for one person at a time, except for these odd moments, like the end of the duet in Tristan and Isolde, where the two of them mm-hmm. uh, join their voices, but not for very long. There's a mm-hmm. coitus interruptus almost immediately afterwards. Right. right. But I mean, I don't say any of this again. Any of this against Wagner. It's just an attempt to define for myself the peculiarity of, of what he does. I mean, in a way, he's concerned with bigger things than, than human life. I mean, mm-hmm. he's concerned with life itself, which is not monopolized by human beings. So he's very interested by... I mean, he's, the mu- his music is, is created by his sense of the life in nature. I mean, the, you know, the life of the fire, the life of the water, mm-hmm. the life of plants, which he was fascinated by him. Mean, there's one of the, the, the one of the Wesendonk leader about the plants in the conservatory mm-hmm. is all about that. I mean, you know, looking at these plants which are belong in a tropical climate and are estranged in, in a colder climate and are still trying to keep themselves alive. And uh, all the you know, the life of animals as well. I mean mm-hmm. not only his his dogs uh, but uh, you know well he did say something really extraordinary about 
about animals. I mean, he said to Cosimo once uh, that the suffering of animals was actually much more tragic than the suffering of human beings because human suffering can turn out to be positive or redemptive. I mean, you know, it can make us better human beings. Uh, you know, it can um, reconcile us to our own weakness, I mean, whatever. Uh, whereas the suffering of animals is uh, something you know, completely brutal and inescapable. They have, they have no recourse. They have you know, no way of, of overcoming it. You mm -hmm. know? I mean, if a dog is going to die, it just crawls away into the bushes and dies completely on its own. Mm -hmm. you know, a bit like the way Tristan dies in the, in the third act, completely mm -hmm. comfortless, mm -hmm. not wanting to be comforted. So that in the moment he hears that Isolde is actually coming, he tears the wounds off his bandages to make sure that he dies an honest death, which is a completely solitary and comfortless death. And th I mean, I think there's, there's a huge sympathy in Wagner, but it, it's not it's not concentrated on human beings mm. somehow. And I mean, yeah, I mean, he he had larger concerns really, which were the you know, I mean, the the beginning of life. And the, and the end of life, I mean, what you were listening to at the beginning of Das Rheingold or in the Venusberg music is the kind of, you know, the, the stirring of life instinct. You know, I mean, the first moments when mm -hmm. something becomes animate and begins to move and the world comes alive. And what, you're, what you also hear in the later music, I mean, he said about the third act of, the prelude to the third act of Parsifal, he said to Cosima, this is... This is the sound of a dying planet, and mm. he was he was very he was obs obsessed with towards the end of his life with uh, the, the, something that everyone was obsessed with at the end of the 19th century, and this is the the death of nature, the death of mm -hmm. of the potential death of the earth. He said about um, he said it, well, another one of his rather uncheering table talk remarks to Cosima, which she jotted down, was the, you know, the, the whole, the earth is just a firework display. You know, just, you know, kind of goes up in smoke and it's very brilliant for a few minutes and then foot, it's, it's all over, it's all extinguished. I mean, he makes us very sensitively aware of all of this and, and gives us a real sense of the tragedy mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. But it's not a human tragedy, hmm. particularly. Mm -hmm. I'm going to change the subject. Okay. Uh, we've, we've talked about this a lot. Uh, when you started going to opera, and you started going to Wagner opera in particular, um, they, you saw these near godlike figures actually perform in Wagner, people like Birgit Nilsson and Leonie Rizanek and John Vickers. Uh, and yeah, I think they, these people really shaped your understanding of of these of these operas of what opera was in general, uh, yeah, um, yeah, it's somehow hard to uh, you know, be reconciled to Debbie Joy Voigt. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Debbie. Uh, but uh, changes in vocal style, or whatever, or whatever else. I, th I think that many people will agree that these were this was an extraordinary period for Wagner performance. Yeah. Uh, but what? Who were these people? What caused that? They, the, you've talked about the, you've talked about the power of their singing being uh, being almost like a drug, uh, something something that you could just take over an audience. Yeah. But you've also had insights into the, the people themselves, into, into particularly Nilsson, yeah. uh, and and the process that went on when she would hold an audience in thrall with, with her artistry and the sound of her voice. Yeah. Uh, she was the most mysterious example, really, I, I think. I mean, I think I understood... I, I, I um, met Riesenek on a number of occasions, and I wrote something about her in Opera News, as it were, which she and her husband pounced on immediately. Mm. I mean, they were always uh, very, very eager to... Um, um, spend time with those who admired her, and it was, you know, I mean, a great, a great thing for me too to, to meet her. Uh, I mean, she said something that that made me understand what she was doing. I mean, she was the of of those three. I mean, Nelson Vickers and Rizanek. I mean, she was the 
the easiest to understand, I think. Um, and the thing that, that um, made me understand what she was doing, I think, was something that she once said, which was this, when I feel an audience loves me, then I can be a bad woman, hmm. she said. Hmm. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's what you had from her. I mean, this tremendous force that was just projected at you, um, you know, which was the force of desire, uh, you know, yearning. I mean, it was all very, very erotic. Well, I mean, you know, there, was, just, there was something extremely um, uh, wildly erotic, erotic about, about this, her, the, yeah. sim very, the symbol of which is that scream. Is, yeah. That she used to let out when yeah. Siegfried, when Siegmund pulled the sword out of the of the the tree. I mean, it was just you know, uh, it was the female principle writ large. Yeah, was, yeah, and that's uh, uh, and although lots of people disapproved of of that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to me she was expressing what Wagner, from one point of view, really is about. Um, you know, Nietzsche said in one of his essays on Wagner, I mean, it's, what would you call a female Wagnerian, uh, whom he spelled in the French way a Wagnerienne. Um, you know, this is a, a voluptuous woman, almost an, a nymphomaniac. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was, um, and a lot of this, these, these mad fantasies about Wagnerian sopranos and their libertine behavior at the, in these novels at the end of the 19th century are... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, written from a male point of view and feeling very hostile and fearful about female sexuality, mm -hmm. but to, you know, which which obviously we no longer do. But what what you got from Riesneck in that scream was mm -hmm. you know, kind of immense erotic triumph and celebration. I mean, by contrast with which, I mean, there's a, a Vickers was was very. Uh, although he was a great Wagnerian, I mean, a really great Wagnerian, I mean, he was an anti-Wagnerian, Wagnerian, who, for his own religious reasons, disapproved of the operas mm -hmm. in which he appeared. I mean, he wouldn't sing in Tannhäuser at all because he th couldn't bring himself to utter the words Heilge Elisabeth Bitter for me, für mich, which was treating the dead Elizabeth, as if she were able to intercede at the throne of God. Mm. Uh, he used to claim, and I think there was a certain amount of bad faith in this, that to sing the Rome narration was very, very easy. No, I could do that. He used to say, no trouble at all. It's just the, those final words high about Heilge Elizabeth, conferring holiness on Elizabeth, he couldn't bring himself to to utter. I remember Riesenek saying about this refusal to sing Tannhäuser, yeah, well, he didn't have any trouble singing Herod, she said. <laughs> you know, that, that, that was easier to, to sing. But, I mean, he, he also made sure whenever he appeared in Parsifal mm -hmm. that um, the director wasn't presenting Parsifal as a version of, of Christ. Mm -hmm. And he had his own view of Tristan as, as well. Um, which he, he was famous for saying to Roberta Knie, who sang Tristan with him a lot, uh, and who was young and impressionable and therefore could be lectured to in a way that uh, you can't imagine him laying down the law to, to Bigger Nelson. He, he was famous for saying to her, Roberta, you must understand, Isolde is a bad girl. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, you know, be, because uh, for Isolde, that relationship is about sex, but, mm -hmm. uh, and she's completely guiltless uh, about what she feels for Tristan, but Tristan is destroyed by his guilt and finally kills himself mm -hmm. or you know, tears his bandages off so as to, to die uh, to perform this judgment on himself. But, the, but by contrast with, with Riesenegg giving vent to this enormous scream of erotic triumph, the thing that Vickers often did was despite the fact that he had this huge voice, oh as God. all these people did. You could mm -hmm. not believe that one, you know, kind of stocky Canadian lumberjack was producing this quite cosmic volume of sound, which was never loud. It was just enveloping, engulfing, mm -hmm. oceanic. It wasn't a loud noise at all. It was, it was just an ocean that completely swamped you. But the, the incredible thing that he used to do was to tune the volume down to a kind of falsetto. Mm -hmm. which he famously always did in Die Valkyrie when putting the distraught Sieglinde to sleep in the second act. And he has this, this great phrase, this is Schwester Geliebte. Mm -hmm. 
and he'd begin, you know, with Schwester, you know, with kind of the, the huge volume, and then fine it down until you could almost not hear the word Galibta, which was, I think was, you know, it's not just a vocal mannerism. It was his way also of drawing back from this incestuous relationship that he that he disapproved of uh, somehow. I mean, he was, al- he was always fighting against the music somehow, mm-hmm. which is what made his performances so extraordinary. I mean, he was, he was in the music, but outside it simultaneously. And the performances were a product of this sort of war within himself. With, uh, with Nelson, it uh, was much harder because she gave very little away. Uh, to understand what was going on there, but uh, I mean, she just had the capacity to turn this stuff on mm. and then turn it off. I heard her once interviewed at the Metropolitan Museum a uh, sh- couple of years after she'd retired. It was a public interview conducted by Spate Jenkins, as I remember, and uh, they. one of the things they played was the Curse, Isolde's curse, from one of her early performances of uh, Tristan at, mm-hmm. the, at the Met, which was unbelievable. I'm just sort of scalding venom and, and fury, uh, you know, just absolutely hatred focused to a, a really fine point, a completely lacerating sound. And they played this, and uh, you know, everyone's completely electrified by it, and she just sat there chuckling. <laughs> and at the end of it, Jenkins said, well, what are you laughing about? And she said, well, if you understood the circumstances, she said, just before that particular performance, she'd had a, a little disagreement with Mr. Bing in the wings because he told her that she was not allowed to appear on the Ed Sullivan show <laughs> because she was under contract <laughs> to the Met. <laughs> and in those days when high standards were maintained, this <laughs> kind of vulgar television variety show was off limits for Mr. Bing singers and she'd signed a contract as they all did saying that any other outside engagements during her time at the Met mm. had to be approved by Bing and he absolutely refused to let her appear on uh, on the Ed Sullivan show and she said so I went out there and I sang that against Mr. Bing mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know I mean, she could she could turn it on and and turn it off I mean th- that's the most mysterious thing I, I told you this the other day when mm. we were talking the this is not about Wagner, it's about Strauss, who for these purposes is, is I suppose, one and the same. It was a, a performance of Electra that I saw with her, with Riesenek, and also with Christa Ludwig in Paris. I think it was in 1974, conducted by Bohm. Uh, I think the rest of my life, operatically, has been a complete anti-climax <laughs> after, after that, just about... The arrest in that performance is a Finnish baritone, Tom Krauser, who died last year. I met him at, at some stage and asked him about this performance, and he said it was, it was absolutely extraordinary to be around this because he, in, during the recognition scene, he's cradling this woman in his arms, uh, and she was producing this sound, which you know, he could see from the stage, was you know just had people you know kind of going under for the third time in the in the in the audience. I mean this kind of Wagner Strauss thing that that you have you know that you just reduce to complete jelly in your seat like like a drowning man going down for the for the third time as this music washes over you and as this you know I mean, the intensity of this emotion mm-hmm. works upon you to completely turn you inside out. Um, because somehow you feel that all of the grief and misery in the whole but world has has been made vocal. But anyway, he, he said that he could see the effect that she was having on the audience, and he just looked sideways at her. And you see this completely impassive face, and these eyes, uh, that, that, that all she was concerned with was, you know, kind of tightening the diaphragm or getting the sound to this place in the head or, you know, kind of... She was doing it in a completely engineered mm-hmm. way, mm-hmm. which was creating emotion in others, but she was exempting herself from feeling the emotion, emotion herself. I mean, I suppose there are two kinds of, of performers in, in opera and in theater generally, I suppose, those who, who feel it uh, 
and who expend themselves every time mm -hmm. are... That would be Rizanek, I would think. I guess. Yeah. And those who, you know, know what the feeling is and can access the feeling, mm -hmm. but don't put themselves at risk mm -hmm. in the moment, which would be her. And then Vickers is, a, you know, Vickers is able to feel it, but hates himself for feeling it <laughs> somehow or disapproves of himself for feeling it. And th there's a kind of... I mean, it's very strange, all of this. I mean, it's very like a kind of demonic possession, really. I was very struck by something that, that Natrebko said about her Lady Macbeth last October. That She said what someone asked her. I think this might have been on the, the HD broadcast in the intermission where you, they asked these dumb questions, to which she gave a very smart answer on, on this occasion. Uh, someone said, well, you know, what are you thinking as they push the bed out there? Uh, at the beginning of her first scene where she says, you remember lying under the sheets, tossing and turning. And what she said is, I am just thinking, will lady come to enter my body? Hmm. And, you know, so these people are in contact with some sort of power to which hmm. the rest of us don't have access, That's maybe exactly. fortunately. <laughs> Perhaps. Hmm. But there's not a lot of that kind of divine madness around now, and it was it's that kind of craziness that attracted me to uh, opera in the first place. I mean, this was the 1960s, after all, and everyone else was taking drugs, and uh, I was listening to music, mm -hmm. which was, produced the same effect. Right. It was the first time that I'd ever been to Covent Garden and I didn't have very much money to spend because I was a student so I was in the so-called upper slips where you, know, you mostly see this, the singers when they come out for their curtain calls uh, but it was Gwyneth Jones uh, James McCracken and Peter Glossop and it was supposed to be conducted by John Barbaroli who'd recorded it with those people around about the same time but he died just before I don't remember who conducted it the thing that I mean, it was a very important moment for me because obviously I knew the play very well. I was studying English literature and studying Shakespeare that term at, at Oxford. So I knew the play you know, kind of inside out. Uh, and the revelation of it for me was uh, the, the, somehow the, the music took, pushed the play into another dimension. I mean, I, I still think of the play, uh, which is not my, my favorite Shakespeare play by any means, as being, you know, kind of fairly, slightly squalid domestic misunderstanding, you know, all about dirty linen. You know, and you, think, you know why, these, why these people get, so, get their lives so fouled up over so little. But somehow what the music does is to turn it into a completely elemental, a kind of almost cosmic drama, whereby Iago, who has no reason for doing what he does in the play at all, ab absolutely no understanding of, of why he has this grudge against Othello, here becomes the demon, the force of negation, the, the eternal hater, the devil. Desdemona becomes the interceding angel singing the the Ave Maria and forgiving Otello, coming back to life to forgive Otello for killing her and claiming to have killed herself. And uh, Otello is kind of the human soul in between. I mean, it becomes a metaphysical drama and the first noise that you hear of that storm, uh, which is just about the, you know, the loudest noise that you ever hear in the opera with the organ going and the whole place quaking and the chorus screaming. You know, I mean, it, it's... It's as if you're present at the last judgment, in a way. So it was, it was that that I felt. I thought, you know, I mean, the English literature had been my world up to that point, and it remained my world. I mean, it's what I, I spent my life trying to teach to the sons and daughters of the rich in, uh, in Oxford, uh, enjoying the irony of the, the, the fact that it was an Australian who was teaching them about their own literature. <laughs> but what I discovered was that, you know, there was something beyond this, you know, the, the moment you you put music underneath these texts, you know, something extraordinary happens, and it happens too with Falstaff, obviously, which is again, I mean, a, you know, really, you know, sort of sordid, mean play that Shakespeare, Mary Wise of Windsor, that Shakespeare didn't even want to write, and 
Verdi takes it and turns it into, uh, you know, kind of the ultimate human comedy, justifying life on earth and making us laugh at, at our folly. I was never very impressed by Eva Marton in the theatre, although she now, in retrospect, seems to me to be pretty wonderful. But the the, the DVD of, of her Met Lohengrin, which I saw in the theatre, uh, gets to me every time, because in the, in the second act, uh, when she completely loses confidence in herself and has her trust in Lohengrin undermined. And that this kind of wonderful moment when he lifts her up and consoles her, which always makes me cry. This, you know, a real tear makes its way down the, the cheek of hard old Eva Marton. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that, there's a, one of the vicar's great moments as well when he turned the volume down was at the end of Parsifal uh, when Kundry is weeping and he says, uh, du weinst, si es lacht, di awa. You weep, but the meadow is laughing. And the, mm. you know, the, the, and the, the pianissima there, I mean, just, just I, I don't know how to describe what it does or why it has this emotional power. I mean, it's as if the perception of, of this rebirth of nature is so beautiful that he just wants to stand back from it and not even comment on it because human life is so irrelevant to it somehow. But whether he was seeing, whether he was crying or not, I, I doubt. But he said, I mean, but, but all the rest of us were, which is what's important. When Parsifal pushes. Um, Kundri away and has that great explosion of the Amfortas di Wunder. Uh, he's not, he's not, at that moment, he is not sympathizing with Amfortas. He is not feeling pity for Amfortas. He's feeling, in a way, sorry for himself because he now understands from inside his own body what this venereal wound is. And as for as for Brunhilde um, saving Sieglinde, I mean, that's, that's very strange, that long scene where she talks, she tries to persuade uh, Sigmund that to be a, a proper Wagnerian, you should volunteer for the heroic death. I mean, she's completely bewildered by the fact that he's prepared to... Uh, forego his chance of heaven like the Islamic terrorists with all of the, the virgins to mm-hmm. reward them when they crash the planes in order to uh, stay with this poor, feeble woman on earth. She can't understand it. But, but doesn't she have a conversion there in the Toda Sarkundu scene? It happens very quickly. Mm. Uh, so that there's no moment in which... I mean, the, the moment of conversion, I mean, is mm-hmm. she describes in the, the duet, in the dialogue, the argument with Wotan at the very end, mm-hmm. uh, where she remembers what she was experiencing and explains it at much greater mm-hmm. length. I mean, this long paragraph which ends with Dan Breckestein Verbot or whatever, whatever it, it is. But... Uh, and the moment in the third act when she suddenly decides that she's going to rescue Siglinda, I mean, that too is, I mean, it's a, almost kind of impromptu decision. I mean, it's a little bit of a gratuitous act mm-hmm. somehow. I mean, if you look at it from her point of view, um, everything that, that you say is true, but Wagner somehow doesn't look at it from that point of view. And her acquisition of humanity is something that, you know, I mean, even at the end, I mean, she, she, she finds horrible the idea that, that she's now going to be left behind on the earth, uh, her divinity stripped from her to be the prey of anyone who wants to marry her. That horrifies her. But I think it's very odd. I mean, 
the, when Brunhilde decides to save Sieglinde, what she says is, Lebo weib und ein Leben freuen, or something like this. Ein Welsung wächst dir in Schoss. That she's saving Sieglinde because Sieglinde is bearing the future right. in her womb. That, you know, I mean, it, she, it's a sort of political decision in a way, not an emotional well, It's not decision. based on some kind of bond between Brunhilde and no. Sieglinde. It's no. based on... On fate, on on the on, on carrying forward destiny, which is yeah, which is yeah, that Brunhilde's sympathy is for yeah. Sigmund, mm-hmm. and at that point, Sieglinde is oh, just the Siegfried. vessel of of Sigmund's uh, pun of Sigmund's sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. her her is yet unborn mm-hmm. boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Wagner, I mean, was sort of scornful of, of Verdi uh, throughout his life and sneered at the very idea of him. And the extraordinary thing is that they never met uh, by design, I think. Uh, uh, and one moment in Cosmo's Diary describing to the very end of his life in, in Venice when uh, Wagner was in his blue grotto in the Palazzo Vendram Inn on the Grand Canal, this room which was covered with blue silk hangings so that he'd feel himself to be in some submarine grotto while composing, orchestrating Parsifal. Uh, and because it was a very humid day, the, the window was open onto the Grand Canal and a gondolier went past singing a Verdi aria. Mm. Very, mm-hmm. very noisily and abruptly slammed the window shut. Mm-hmm. Wagner slammed the window shut. But Verdi, on the other hand, was fascinated by Wagner. I mean, went to that performance of, of Lohengrin in Bologna, ordered copies of his writings from Paris. Uh, when Wagner died, uh, Verdi issued the equivalent of a press release um, through Ricordi his publisher saying, uh, you know, I mean, this is triste, triste, triste. He, he began by saying, no, I mean, this is a very sad day. A great man has died and, and so on. You feel that un- in between the lines, you feel he's saying, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I can write Otello and, and Falstaff. <laughs> Falstaff. <laughs> but, but, but in fact, it's so tantalizing that they never met that uh, Franz Werfel, who was one of Alma Mahler's husbands, uh, wrote a novel in the 1940s called Verdi, which is about an attempt to engineer a meeting between them. I mean, it's set at the very end of Wagner's life, and Verdi, who's going through a kind of very dry period, as he did after composing Aida, just feels that you know, he's said what he had to say, the, the music is no longer pouring out of him, the world has now been Wagnerized. And he becomes so obsessed with this and so irritated by the presence of Wagner in his own country, this man who has just somehow sentenced him creatively to death, that he goes to Venice to meet Wagner. And they brush up against one another uh, once or twice. I mean, in the the Piazza San Marco at an open-air concert, uh, Verdi is having a cup of coffee and so he sees that Wagner is in the same cafe surrounded by his acolytes and suddenly the band strikes up the triumphal march from <laughs> Aida <laughs> and Wagner seems from where Verdi is sitting to sneer <laughs> which you know, makes, makes Verdi you know, feel icy with hatred. In fact, Wagner has just said to one of his young Wagnerians, you know, that Verdi is maybe not too bad. Mm. But, in the, but anyway, I mean, the, the two... I mean, it's kind of great film noir in a way. I mean, detective, detective story, this. They shadow one another through Venice. Then uh, Verdi um, goes back to his hotel one night and gets out the score of Tristan, which he's brought with him, uh, and reads through it, uh, sits up all night reading the score. And at the end of this experience, when he finally understands what Wagnerism is all about, finally understands the quite cosmic power of it, and understands that this is pushing music into a future where there's no place for him, uh, and decides to commit suicide. But for some reason, he doesn't. I forget, I forget what little twist there is in the plot at that point. I mean, he's like a good Italian. He decides he wants to get up and have an espresso instead. So he goes to... Um, he says, you know, okay, I mean, the cowardly thing would be to commit suicide. What I have to do is go and now make my peace with this man. 
and shake his hand and admit to him that he's the future and that I was the past. So he makes his way round to the Palazzo Vendramin and knocks on the door. And the porter comes to the door, you know, with tears streaming down his face. Verdi says, I would like to see the maestro. And the porter says to him, the maestro died two hours ago. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. So Verdi is then liberated from, from Wagner. But no, I mean, it's a, it's a great non non-story, I mean, the, the, the fact that they didn't meet. And the, one of my reasons for writing the book was to try to imagine what they would have said to one another if they had met, which was probably not a lot. You told me how, you, how fond you are of, of Nina Stemmer. Yes, and uh, no, I mean, I think there are still great singers around. I mean, I mm-hmm. love Carita Matula, for instance. And sure. Her performance in the Macropolis case I mean, had me you know, kind of speechless for hours afterwards, which for me is not a natural <laughs> state to be in at all. Uh, no, but somehow, I mean, it's, you know, it's like there's nothing so intense as first love, probably. I mean, it was the, the impact of these performances, uh, you know, because they seemed to, they came from some world that I knew nothing about. I mean, now I know the, the works very well, and I'm more kind of critical because I've heard so much more, I, I guess. But, no, I mean, one has to fight very hard against the, the hardening of the arteries and, you know, the general kind of staleness that overtakes you a bit. Uh, but I, w- I was just very, very lucky to, to hear all of these people. And it was not only these Wagnerians. You know, these were the days when, you know, one night at the Met it was Sutherland, the next night it was Crespin, the next night it was Pavarotti, and, and so on. You know, it really was a kind of golden age. But, but uh, you know, this is the sort of thing that, that elderly characters say all the time, which is why I don't (laughs) like to hear myself saying it. And I'm really looking forward to Yolanta tomorrow. Oh, very good. Well, Peter, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. It was absolutely great.